the first appearance of new beings on this earth. But he's only collected a couple dozen finches, and he has no way of knowing that in the islands with the finches, you could demonstrate each of those simple steps that I just laid out, the steps in the origin, and you could show how vital variation is, and you could show it leading to evolution, not only within your lifetime, but within a single year. So this is what Peter and Rosemary found. They went to the Galapagos in 1973 for the first time. They pitched camp on this little desert island called Daphne Major in the middle of the archipelago, an island that's such a little speck of rock that Darwin himself never even saw it from the Beagle. They began studying Darwin's finches, and they assumed, as Darwin had assumed, that they would have to infer the evolutionary process from the variations that they were measuring in the birds. They didn't think they could see it themselves any more than Darwin ever thought in his lifetime he could see it. But they found from their first measurements that Darwin's finches are incredibly variable birds. As it happens, and Darwin himself couldn't know this, but as it happens, they're some of the most variable animals in the wild. I mean, it is bizarre how variable they are. Uh, some of my students are here tonight. Actually, my entire seminar is here uh, from the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, and I thank you all for, for coming. And, um, and now I just completely diverted myself from wherever the I was going there. The the, thank you. The incredible variation of the finches. They, um, they found that the beaks of the birds, for instance, vary by as much of a mil as a millimeter within, a, within the population. So uh, that sounds tiny to us, but we're talking about birds about the size of the sparrows of New York City. In fact, they look a little like the sparrows of New York City. And their beaks are far more variable than the beaks of the sparrows of New York City. Oh, I know where I was going. I have two excellent birders in my class who know more <laughs> about this than I would know. So um, these birds are really variable. Variation is, uh, is showcased by these birds. So if you're going to start with variation, then this is an amazing place to look for it in Darwin's finches. And the variations are inherited. So how did the Grants know that? They had to go back to this desert island again and again, year after year, and um, trace the birds. Oh, thanks. They had to trace the birds' um, family trees. And that meant climbing up on boulders, lava boulders, on this desert island and peeking into the, uh, into the nests of the Opuntia cactus. The finches would build their nests high up in the cactus and putting little bands, colored bands, on each baby finch and making careful notes so that they knew who its mama was, who its papa was, and doing that generation after generation. And you have to picture, I can't move away from this, this microphone or I would draw it somewhere, but uh, the, um, uh, the island is shaped, it's a cinder cone sticking up out of the Pacific, and it's as steep as a roof all the way around. So if you, the, the Grant students call it the biggest ashtray in the world. You know, if you picture a classic hotel ashtray uh, stick just floating in the middle of the Pacific, you've got it. When one of their students, Lyle Gibbs, once climbed up to peek into a finch nest so that he could ban the baby finches, he fell, he rolled down the island, then he fell off the cliff because the, the volcano is surrounded by cliffs that the waves have worn away all around. He landed in the Pacific among the sharks because the island is surrounded by sharks. And then he had to swim halfway around the island. Oh, thanks a lot, Phil. All right. Uh, apologies to those of you who are listening. And I'm going to draw a picture of this, uh, this extraordinarily forbidding island. It's like a Jules Verne forbidding island, might almost have inspired him. So there's the Pacific, looking Pacific, looking peaceful. Here is Daphne Major, and the cliffs are like that all the way around. Steep. Very steep. 
very steep, steep as a roof. All right. I don't know if that was worth the, uh, <laughs> the audiovisual effort, but the point about the cliffs is important. If I were a better artist, you would get the, uh, the, get the feel for those cliffs, because the Pacific is usually not Pacific. In fact, Darwin, who was always seasick, complained about this in his letters home, miscalled Pacific, he said. <laughs> the, uh, the waves, if you are on a little zodiac heading for this island because there's no place to dock, the waves are lifting you halfway to the ceiling and then dropping you down to the floor below us. And you have to time your jump from the zodiac onto this little block of basalt that I call, ironically in the book, the welcome mat. The grants do not call it the welcome mat. <laughs> and then you have to climb up a trail, a very steep trail, to the cinder cone, to the one place that's flat enough and sandy enough to pitch a camp, to pitch a tent. And the grants began doing this, as I say, in 1973, and brought their two little girls with them and raised these two little girls on Daphne Major and, um, and in several other islands in the Galapagos and they participated in the banding of the birds. And what the grants were seeing was so exciting to them that they seemed to have focused almost exclusively on the beaks of the finches and hardly ever on um, the faces of their little girls. I'm not saying they were badly brought up. They're very happy kids. <laughs> they, they now have very happy families. But if you look at the slides of Peter and Rosemary Grant and their family, you see finches and finch beaks, variation from one finch to the next to the next. And um, at the Grant's retirement party at Princeton last September, last fall, about a year ago, Nicola Grant said that she was trying to find slides of the family on this desert island for the retirement occasion. And the closest she could come was a picture that showed her hand holding one of Darwin's finches. That was it. So that's why there are no uh, photographs in the beak of the finch, actually. Anyway, they start watching Darwin's finches, documenting this variation from generation to generation. And they still don't, don't believe that they're going to be able to see Darwin's argument in action until a drought year came in 1977. And in 1977, at the start of the year, there were 1,200 Geospes of Fortis, which are medium beak ground finches, on Daphne Major. And I'm rounding that number. The grants have the exact number. And of course, they know who, it's, who those birds' parents and grandparents and great-grandparents were. At the start of the year, 1,200 fortis. By the end of the year, only 180 survived on Daphne Major, a loss of 85%. Of the survivors, it was not a random sample. Of, a, of the survivors, it was the bigger birds with the bigger beaks that made it through. Not longer beaks, not wider beaks, Selection favored a deep and narrow beak among GSBs of Fortis that year. And the reason was tribulus seeds. Tribulus from tribulare, Latin for trouble. These are seeds with terrible spikes, terrible if your beak is measured in millimeters. They have, they're, they're, uh, they're seeds that are encased in a thick coat and that have these spikes like caltrop. If anybody's a fan of medieval armor, you know caltrop, those were the spiky, the, the, the ball with spikes that people would whirl around as a mace or that they would, yeah? That they would, I'd see some, some nods. Some of the collegiate kids. Yeah, that's right. Uh, these seeds, independently of medieval knights, invented caltrop and they are the bane of the existence of most medium beak ground finches on Daphne, except those lucky ones that happen to be born with a longish, narrowish, strong beak. Those are the only ones that are able to crack a tribulus seed.